Several months ago, I went to Houston, uh, and uh, my uncle and aunt lived there. We were going there to see them, right? So we were going there, and because we have two kids now, a two-year-old and a one-year-old that they love with all their hearts, we do fun stuff. So they were like, let's go to a zoo. But it wasn't a Houston zoo. It was an interactive aquarium. Uh, And so I was like, I don't know what this is, but there was a big lemur, and we walked through the lemur to get into this place, and I was like, this seems fun. So we're walking along, and you go in, and you can feed these little tiny sharks with these, you know, shrimp, and it's fun. And then they have this, we walk into this room where there's this massive tank, like four times the size of this stage, and there's signs everywhere to pet the stingrays, welcoming you. The stingrays are going to swim up to the side because they think you have food. You don't, and so you're just going to pet them, right? So life's terrible for them, but you get a couple seconds of enjoyment because, you know, America. And so... Uh, our two year, my, Harvey, my boy, my two-year-old, and Joe, my one-year-old girl, is loving this. So I have Joe's arm elbow deep in this tank, you know, petting the slimy stingray. Harvey, my cousin, had him over it. And then as we're doing this, as we've been doing it for about 20 minutes, an employee walks by and goes, hey, watch out for that puffer fish. He'll take a finger off. And uh, I look, and there's a puffer fish hovering around my daughter's tiny little hand. And so I realized in that moment two things. One, puffer fish uh, are apparently violent killers. I was unaware of that. I thought they just, you know, doubled their size out of fear and then shrunk back down. Apparently, they like to eat your fingers. And two, we were not just at some fun zoo. We were apparently at a horribly managed death place. Uh, and so I keep looking in the tank, and there's like these moray eels, which apparently like one of the deadliest fish in the world. And I pulled up a video the other day because I was, knew I was gonna, this was going to be my intro and found the owner of this place releasing these animals. And he was like, yeah, they come in bags because they bite. Check it out. We didn't even order these. They just came. And I was like, where did we go? So I was like, what, what's happening? And I start to look at all the employees and they're all like 16 at the oldest. And I'm like, how is this not illegal? What's going on? It gets worse. We keep going. I walk around the tank, and there is stairs to the openness of the tank. I knew this because my one-year-old sprinted up the stairs, and I grabbed her and saved her from the eel pufferfish death tank. Again, what is happening? No gate, no warning sign, no one watching the stairs into this tank. It's just there. We keep going. We leave the uh, death area to the, the bird cages. We walked through two sets of doors. There's all these birds flying around. I'm now like, is there a killer eagle in here? So I'm looking and it seems fine. And then a giant tortoise walked by my feet. I was like, I didn't, I don't think it's a bird. I, it's been a while since, you know, whatever, science class, sixth grade. But there's a tortoise in here. I guess they didn't have any room until later I left and I passed far away an empty tortoise cage. And so I just, over time, came to the conclusion, I am not at a zoo. I am basically in a bunch of cages with animals, with teenagers watching me. And had there been more aggressive animals than pufferfish, we would all be dead. My whole family would be dead. Uh, There's this shocking, I thought, I'm going to a zoo. There would be walls between me and the violent animals, and perhaps a moat and I could gaze and wave, and maybe they'll look at us from far off. No, I was there, right? The reality was death was waiting around every single corner, and it was a horrible experience, but I recommend it if you're ever in Houston. Uh, (laughs) So today, we are going to look at a passage where Jesus is going to show us the reality of sin, the true reality of sin, that it is not a casual thing that can just hang around. You are far, far, far less in control than you believe you are. You are not at a zoo, and it's on the other side of some big cage, and you've got this sin, and yeah, I probably should confess it, but I'll get there one day. Jesus is going to show you, you are in the cage with the lion. You're in the pufferfish tank, which is apparently worse than piranhas, right? They're the silent killer. I've done a lot of research since then. That's the true reality of sin. And as a result, you must do something very, very, very drastic to deal with this reality that every single person in this room is in right now. So we're going to look at three things today. The true heart of adultery, how sin kills you, and how you kill sin. True heart of adultery, 
how sin kills you and how you kill sin. Let's look at verse 27. You have heard it said, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone that looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So just a, a reminder of the context where we've been. We're walking through the Sermon on the Mount. And before that, we've been walking through Jesus has just started his ministry in the Gospel of Matthew. We've seen his birth story. We've seen this anticipation of his arrival. John the Baptist declaring the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then the king shows up and he begins to preach the gospel of the kingdom and people from every city are coming and following him. And then a few weeks ago, we started the Sermon on the Mount where this king stands and begins to declare the most famous sermon in history, the Sermon on the Mount, primarily showing what is this kingdom that arrives when I arrive? What is it like? What is its people like? How does it deal with other kingdoms in the world? How does it relate to the Old Testament and the law that has come before it? And so particularly in in the past few weeks, we've looked at how does this kingdom relate to the law? the Old Testament, everything that come before it. And we saw a few weeks ago, Jesus says, I'm not here to overthrow the old. I'm not here to overturn everything that has come before me. In fact, everything that has come before me is a giant arrow to me. And I'm here to actually show you the true meaning and the true intent, the true purpose of the law, the true purpose of everything that has come before me. And for the rest of chapter five, we've been looking at Example. So last week, Carl taught on murder slash anger. So showing Jesus saying, you've heard it, you know, don't murder. But what's the true intent? What's the true meaning behind that law? It's the hate in your heart that leads to murder. And today we're going to look at the second example. Again, this is going to carry us these examples. We're going to keep looking at them through chapter five. Second example is adultery. So look again at verse 27. You have heard it that it was said you shall not commit adultery. So there's the law, right? Most famously in the Ten Commandments, it's commandment number seven. It's also in Deuteronomy 5, Leviticus 18. You shall not commit adultery. There's the law. And then Jesus says, but I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So you see there, first of all, He's not giving a new law. He's not saying, wipe that one off. Here's a new law. He's saying, here is the true intent behind that law. Here's the true meaning of the law. It's the lustful look in your heart that leads to adultery. That's where the sin begins. It's not just the act itself of adultery that God cares about. He cares about the sin brewing in your heart that leads to the act. So notice, where is Jesus highlighting Sin's beginnings. Here. Here. It's in the lustful look. It's in the thing you think nobody else knows about. It's just you and your secrets. That's where sin begins. And God knows it. And Jesus is showing up and saying, here's my father's true intent behind this adultery command. Sin starts in the heart. Jesus will say later in Matthew 15, for out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander, right? You don't accidentally commit murder. You don't accidentally commit adultery, right? It starts somewhere, right? Jesus is showing the true intent of the heart. It starts with the lustful look, again, in the secret place, in the hidden place where you think it's harmless, hurting anybody, right? It's hidden away, and it actually leads to something. Or to say it another way, the act of adultery reveals sin that has already been present. It's just now visible, right? Murder reveals the anger that's been there for a long time. It's just now visible to us. Okay, you see that. Sin starts here and manifests breaking the law, but God cares about this part as well. Quick clarifier, We're going to talk about divorce next week and what uh, is or is not grounds for divorce, potentially. This is not a statement Jesus is making to say, lustful looks is grounds for divorce. 
Don't, don't misunderstand that. Don't say, okay, lust equals adultery, therefore, because adultery is potentially grounds for divorce. Don't, don't make that leap. Jesus isn't trying to give arguments. He will do that later of what is and is not grounds for divorce. Here, he's just showing the truth behind the command and where sin begins, showing the origin of sin in the same way that he wouldn't say, you know, being angry with someone and calling them a fool, therefore, you should be locked up for murder. Right? He's making a statement about the revelation of where sin begins, and he's revealing, don't miss this, he, the Word of God, the Son of the living God who has been eternally with the Father, is revealing his Father's heart in giving these commands. And here, right here, understanding this is the difference between worshiping the false God of moralism and legalism that is so often worshipped in our Bible Belt culture who just wants you following rules, and you gain his favor by following rules. The difference between following that false God and the living God of the Bible. God has never primarily been after your outward behavior. He cares about your heart. There are times all throughout Israel's history where they worship God with their lips, but their hearts are far From him. There's times where they have all the right rituals. They're following all the sacrifices that they're supposed to do. They're keeping all the festivals that they're supposed to do. And God says things like this in Amos 5 I hate, I despise your feasts. I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and your grain offerings, they're doing it, right? The law, what they're supposed to do. Even though you offer your burnt offerings and your grain offerings, I will not accept them. And the peace offering of your fattened animals, I will not look upon them. Take away the noise of your songs. God doing this when they sing their hymns. Take away the noise of your songs and the melody of your harps. I will not listen, but let justice roll like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing Stream. You see what God cares about there. You see what God longs for there. Hearts of justice, hearts of righteousness that pour out, worship that pours out of a heart that loves God. If your marriage is on fire, and it has been for a long time, and you don't care, and you show up here, and your hands are raised, and God is so good, and you go back and casually, complacently go through and let the sins that you know are there hang around, hear your God. Repent. I want your heart. I've never been after your hypocritical outward behavior. See the Pharisees, who their outward behavior is close to perfect, but what does Jesus call them? Whitewashed tombs. They look beautiful on the outside. Inside, it's rotting. And God says, I'm not fooled by that. And Jesus is saying, here's what my father's always been about. He doesn't care about your hypocritical outward behavior. He cares about your heart. Sing your praises, but let it flow from a heart that knows there's no righteousness here, and I'm clinging to Jesus for my righteousness. That says, these sins will not fester in my life. I'm fleeing to the merciful God who can actually rip them out. I'm not keeping up appearances because this is the Bible Belt and we put on our best clothes, right? And we would never let anybody know that anything's wrong with our lives. Or to say it another way, the exact opposite of the gospel. God is not fooled. Look at David in Psalm 51. We sang it this morning. David knows the heart of his God. David commits adultery, murders one of his closest friends, hides it, and is caught. And look what David says here. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Notice this. For you will not delight in sacrifices, or I would give it. I'm caught in my sin. If I thought killing a couple animals would make you happy, I would do that, but I know better. I know you wouldn't delight in that. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. Look at verse 17. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit and a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. 
Similarly, David's running and saying, you know what's broken? You know what I'm laying before you? My heart that sees its sin and is saying, oh, I'm so sorry. And you know what I know? You won't despise that. That's what you delight in. A harsh warning isn't coming from an angry God. It's a God pleading with you, please just come lay down. Not an animal, not your outward works, your sin. That's what I long for, your heart to go on the altar. Jesus revealing it's not just about not committing the act of adultery. God has always, always, always been after your heart. Do you see the difference in your view of God there? One is... A God that says, follow my rules and we're cool. The other is one who says, come lay your life down. Sacrifice your heart on the altar and let your obedience that, yes, of course, I care about, flow from a heart that loves me and loves neighbor. So the two things I want you to see in this first part is, one, who your God is. Who is the God that gives these commands that Jesus is revealing? This is who my Father is. He doesn't want your hypocritical behavior. He wants you. He doesn't just want your outward works. He wants you. He's not a strict taskmaster far off that just wants outward obedience and then he's pleased. He wants you. You're meant to live and move and have your being in him every waking moment. Of your life. So, how do you know? How do you know if you're worshiping the false God of legalism versus this God of the Bible? Quite simply, when you go before Him, what do you say? Do you say, I'll do better? I know you're upset. I know I've been failing. I'll do better and I'll get back in your good graces by somehow laying up good works before you, even though I know you say, All my good works are filthy rags. I'm just forgetting all that other Bible stuff you've ever said about my works, right? Do you say, I'll do better, God, and then you'll finally be pleased with me? Or do you like David? Say, I know you're my father. I know you sent your son to actually heal this failure. You looked upon my failure. You looked upon me right now wallowing in the pit. For God so loved the world, he sends his son. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You see the difference there. One is the gracious, merciful God of the Bible that says, come lay your sins down. I already know them, and I've sent my son to pay for them. You see the difference there between the false god of legalism and the god of the Bible. One is an unconcerned taskmaster that doesn't really exist. It doesn't exist at all. The other is your father who sent his son for your failure. Okay, I'm spending time here because we so often, especially with heavy passages like this, the first thing that happens is what happened in the garden. Our view of God's character changes. What's the first thing Satan goes after? God didn't really mean that. He said that because he knows you'll actually be God. You'll be like him. His motives are wicked. You can't trust him. God goes, or Satan goes right after God's character, and we still listen to that lie every time sins are brought up. And so don't miss who your God is in the midst of heavy warnings like this. The second thing I want you to see, which is very, very important, is sin is not primarily out there. Sin is not primarily external to you, and sometimes you trip and fall because sin out there grabs your ankles. Sin is here. Sin is in you. You are not, we would never say this out loud, but we typically believe we're basically good. We have a billion people who are worse than us that we constantly are reminding ourselves, I'm not that bad, right? Sure, I snap at my kids, but not like, you know, whoever over there almost said a name, but We've got every name in here, and I don't want (laughs) you to think I'm talking about you. That's some sort of passive-aggressive thing. So we basically think we're good, and that, yeah, circumstances. I'm just in a tough season right now because of other people, and that's why I'm sinning so much. That is exactly backwards. Right? I, 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 kid, having kids made me realize how selfish I was. Here's what didn't happen. It's not like Harvey and Joe threw selfishness on me. I, just before they existed, was getting everything I wanted. So selfishness was here, and Harvey and Joe made the volcano explode. So it would be ridiculous for me to say, these kids, they made me so selfish. You know, No, they just brought out sin that was already here. You see that difference? It's very easy to say, because this, because this, and because you, you kind of did this. I'm sorry I blew up, but 
you were kind of, you know, being a horrible person to live with, so I'm sorry, I guess. Yeah, don't do that, okay? The sin starts here. It is not external to you. It is within. You need to see it, and you need to be appropriately terrified of it. Appropriately terrified terrified of it. In Tolkien's Lord of the Rings, you don't really get this with the movies, but in the books, there are several heroes that uh, fall and using the ring, this, this ring of power that corrupts and, and twists your heart, and every single one of them wants to use it for good, and they think they can master it. Yeah, it's made other people fall, but I'm going to use it for good, and I'm actually going to defeat the evil people with it, and every single one of them, as they've overestimated their abilities to control sin, are corrupted and mastered by it. The only characters that survive it are those who say, don't bring it near me. I don't trust myself near it. I don't want to have anything to do with it. And one of the things that's going to keep you from sin is knowing your capacity to sin. It is a terrifying thing to say, I would never do that. You would. Do not underestimate the power of sin. Yes, you can intellectually think, I would never murder someone or something like that. But do not underestimate. Be appropriately terrified of what you are capable of as a sinner. How did the Sermon on the Mount start? Blessed are the poor in spirit. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Those who come and say, there's nothing here that I would ever lay claim to but wicked poverty. All my righteousness is found elsewhere, namely in Jesus. Blessed, those are the people of the kingdom, people who say, terrifying, you look here, scary. Being appropriately fearful of what you are capable of because, as we'll see next, sin has one motivation. The sin in your life has one motivation to kill you, to kill you. Look at the next section. You guys doing good? This is fun. Okay. (laughs) The next section, how sin kills you. It gets a little happy at the end. Don't worry. Uh, How sin kills you. So last week, uh, or uh, like last week, Jesus is going to give the command, and he's going to broaden it a little bit and crank up the heat. So this was a fun intro. It's about to get more intense. Uh, So he's going to broaden from lust to sin and then crank up the heat a little bit. Look at verse 29. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away, for it is better for you to lose one of your members than that the whole body be thrown into hell. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away, for it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. Perhaps an immediate clarifier is helpful, because I know some of you are... uh, unhealthily armed right now. Uh, You know, a lot of knives in this room, and you might be real pious, and you're like, got it, done. Uh, Jesus is not advocating for Uh, self-mutilation. Some people in the early church thought he was, and they did it, and they still sinned, because as we had just talked about, sin is here, not here, okay? Jesus here, as we'll see, is using extreme language to make a certain point, but so, yeah, gouging out, it's weird to preach a sermon where you're like, Jesus doesn't, isn't meaning what it really, really, really sounds like he's meaning, but he's not advocating for self-mutilation. He's using, again, extreme language uh, to show the reality of sin. So Jesus here, what are you to do when sin rears its head, when you see that sin is present? If your right eye or your right hand cause you to sin, gouge it out, cut it off. This sort of violent, quick motion, this quick reaction as you see sin. Imagine walking through, you know, the woods or something and a snake that was climbing a tree falls and lands on your shoulders. You're not like, what is happening right now? You would, you know, at least if you're normal like me, you'd freak out, scream a little bit and get it off as fast as possible, right? Or walking, you know, I'm, I'm, we take walks in our neighborhood and birds always fly over. And imagine, you know, birds flying over and they just drop you a present and it lands on your face. Would you say, does anyone have a napkin? You would just, very casual, no, you would, you know, it's quick, this sort of violent reaction. That is the picture here. Cut it off, rip it off, throw it away as fast as you can. Again, using this sort of extreme imagery to show the unbelievable seriousness of sin. To say, deal with sin 
violently, even if it's your right eye or your right hand. What they mean by that is your good hand or your good eye. So it's very handist, but it was another time. You know, it's, it's highly offensive in our day. Back then, everybody was all pro right hand guys. Uh, and so, uh, right, he's essentially saying, whatever you need to do to kill sin, do it. Do whatever is necessary because sin wants to kill you. It's doing everything necessary to kill you. What is the alternative to this person that Jesus is talking about? If they don't cut off the hand, if they don't gouge out the eye, if they let sin hang around, what is the alternative? Where is sin dragging them? Eternal death. Hell. Sin has one motivation. Jesus here is highlighting the nature of sin. And perhaps the most terrifying thing about sin most of the time is that it makes itself look very innocent and makes itself look beautiful. The first Batman movie I ever saw was the George Clooney, uh, Iceman, Mr. Freeze, Arnold one. I don't know what it was called. I don't recommend it, not because it's inappropriate, but because, and I mean this, it is not good. Uh, and so there's, there's Mr. Freeze, and then there's two other villains in it. Bane, who is like this roided up, gross, slimy, evil dude who can't speak because all he wants to do is just rage and kill people, and then Poison Ivy. So you have these two villains. What One, who we think sin looks often like Bane, jacked, very obvious, okay, that's sin, and then Poison Ivy. And she, uh, very beautiful, very soft-spoken, but if you kissed her, you would die. That is actually probably a far more uh, accurate representation of sin. How does Paul describe the devil appearing to you? An angel of light and his false teacher followers also appear as an angel of light, beautiful to you. What does false teaching do to your ears? It scratches them. It tells you what you want to hear, right? It seems innocent and beautiful, desirable to go after. It whispers, I'm fine. You're in control. You don't have to worry about me. You're, you, you know, don't confess this. I'm good. You're mainly in control. People will think bad of you if you confess this. That's exactly how sin talks, makes itself look beautiful and makes itself look innocent. God gives a very different picture of sin. Go back with me to Genesis, not to Genesis 3, the next chapter. Right after the fall in Genesis 4, you have Cain and Abel. Both offer sacrifices. Abel's is accepted. Cain's is rejected, and he's mad. And God comes to him and describes to him what is happening in his heart, gives this picture. Cain, probably thinking a lot like us, I'm mad, but it's just kind of kind of hang around, not that big of a deal. And God says, Cain, sin is crouching at your door. And its desire is for you, and you need to kill it. That's God's picture of sin. It's not a nice cat running around your house, and it's just a stray, so it's a little bit of concern. I don't know how it got here. It's a lion, and it's at the door, and it's crouching. Its next movement is a lunge, and its desire is for you. You must master it. And if you know the story, Cain doesn't master it, it masters him, and it kills Abel, and it essentially kills him. And so Jesus here is giving an unbelievably gracious warning to say, sin is not what it is telling you that it is. It is not this casual thing that you are in control of. You're not at the zoo. You're at this Houston death trap, right? You're in the cage with the lion. And since that is the reality of sin, since that's what's true, you must deal with it violently. You cannot let it hang around. That envy that's stirring in your heart is not just going to go away. It's going to grow and take over. That unforgiveness that you will not let go will try and kill you. That pride will manifest itself and destroy everyone around you. That bitterness that's stirring in your heart has one motivation, and it is to take over. It's crouching at your door, and it wants you. It wants to kill you. Therefore, you have two options. Cut it off or be cut off. Throw it away or be thrown away. John Owen, the great uh, Puritan theologian in his book, The Mortification of Sin, 
had a very famous line, be killing sin or it will be killing you. There's no third way. There's no third option. It's one of those two, kill sin or it will kill you. So if you're not a Christian, if, you're, if you haven't trusted Jesus, this is a glimpse into your eternity. And it is a gracious warning from a merciful Savior to flee to him. If you're a Christian, potentially in name only, you grew up here, or Christianity is just kind of a set of morals that you say yes to because you value conservatism or something like that, this may actually reveal the sin that goes constantly unchecked in your heart that you don't really care about, may reveal you've never actually come to the Savior. But I know in this room there's so many of you who have and who love him and just are sinners saved by grace, and you just have a natural, you, you, you're freaking out right now. And you're asking, you know, is this, does every sin mean we're going to hell? What about security of salvation, that kind of thing? And so here, I want you to see, Jesus isn't addressing that topic of security of salvation. Jesus here, first of all, is going to go pay for all of your sins on the cross in a few chapters. Don't forget, don't just forget everything else that we've heard. Second of all, sin isn't going to kill you eternally. If you've come to him, he's paid for your sin It's him, he's the founder, he's the perfecter of your faith, he's the one that says, no one steals them from my hand, right? But here's what sin will kill. It will kill your joy. It'll kill your communion that you were made for. It will kill everything that you come to Christ for, him, your communion with him, your joy in him. Uh, My my kids, my two kids that are 99.100% of my sermon analogies, Harvey now is two, And uh, he's in a very selfish toy phase where Joe, who can walk, he just, you know, Joe will come into Rome and he'll get all his cars and just do this for like 90 straight minutes. He will just, and so he's, yes, he's being mean to her. He's not allowing her to play with toys. What is he doing to himself? Who else is not having fun? Him. His sin is robbing him of joy, of actually getting to play and letting his sister play a little bit as well. But he's also wounding himself. And that is exactly what you do to yourself when you indulge in the sinful pleasures of the world. What did we sing earlier with David? What is one of the things that David cries out to God in Psalm 51, 12? Restore to me the joy of my salvation, what has been lost in his sin that he wants back desperately as he is repenting to God, the joy of his salvation that has been cut off. If you're neglecting the fountain of life, of course you're going to shrivel more and more. You're robbing yourself of just the infinite joy of the Savior that says, come to me for the fleeting false pleasures of the world. And again here, Jesus is being a very, very gracious Savior, warning you away. There's no life there. You're running towards a cliff. There's only death that way. You know, my kids running into oncoming traffic, my love for them makes me scream louder, right? I'm probably yelling loudly and it looks really angry, but it's out of my love for them and I'm calling them back. So again, here, Jesus, a gracious Savior. An indifferent Savior doesn't care about giving you warnings. Hearing a hard saying from Jesus, don't think, wow, we made someone mad. Gosh, I thought you were a merciful God. A merciful or an unmerciful God doesn't care about warning you of where your sin is taking you. It's taking you to the pit, and he wants you to have life. And so he's calling you away, telling you you must kill sin. It will kill you. How does it kill you? You let it hang around. Pretend that lion is a little stray house cat and it's not going to mess with you. Let it hang around. It must be killed. Those are your two options. Be killing it, or it will be killing you. And so the final question that we've all been waiting for is how? How, if we aren't allowed to actually cut off our hand and gouge out our eye, I know that y'all really wanted that. Uh, If you've taken that option away from us, Jared, how do we actually kill this sin that wants to kill us? And there's three ways. There's three steps. Number one is quite simply to see everything we've been talking about. See the reality of sin, that it is not some casual thing, right? See the reality, it's crouching at your door. It wants you. Do not let it hang around. You are not in control of it. It must be cut off. It must be killed. Wake up from that illusion. That's step one, to see 
you know, it's not this innocent thing. It's not this beautiful thing. It wants to kill you. Doors are always left open at our house, so we'll get flies that come in. And one fly, I don't really care. Well, I care. They like poop. I didn't know flies did that, but I'm like, what are these spots on the wall? Fly poop. They do that. Uh, So I got one of those bug assault guns. None of that's important. But mostly I don't care. (laughs) Now, imagine uh, a wasp comes in. The more serious it gets, the more I react. A wasp, I'm like, eh, I'll kill that thing because one of those things are one of my kids. A bird, I'm a little concerned because I don't trust birds. I think they're too quick, like their head movements are too quick. So I'm, you know, I've got to get this thing out of here. A hawk, terrified. I'm getting my family out of the house. Something worse, a lion, something like that. I'm screaming out for neighbors. I went to private school. I don't know how to deal with this, right? I got to get people in here who are going to help me kill this thing. Right? Your sin, just imagine a dragon. If that, this is the worst thing. That is what is in your heart. Wake up to that reality. Don't listen to the lies that it's innocent. That's step one, everything we've been talking about thus far. Step two, drag your sin into the light. Drag your dark sins into the light. First John 1 John 1.1. This is the message that we have heard from him and proclaimed to him that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Darkness can't live in the light. Go into a room with the light off and turn on the light and see how much darkness is left. Zero, right? It flees. Same with your sin. Drag it into the light, namely the light of Christian community. Drag it in to the light of your brothers and sisters in this very room. Be known. Be known, not for the facade that you want people to know, but for who you should be known by, a sinner saved by a gracious Savior. The godliest people I know, the most humble people I know, repent more than anybody else I know, because they are very, 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 very much convinced there's no righteousness here. I'm not trying to portray any sort of false holiness here. My righteousness is in Christ, and so that's who I'm constantly fleeing to. That's someone who's understood the gospel, not the person who's like, don't really have anything to confess, right? I just didn't really sin much lately because that's just kind of how I do things, right? Don't get the gospel exactly backwards, okay? Bring it into the light. Confess often. Repent quickly. Don't let sin gasp for breath. Put it to death, namely through your brothers and sisters in Christian community, and realize, please do this. Hopefully you, you, you're getting this as we've been walking through the Beatitudes. Realize the fresh air of repentance. We often don't repent because of shame. We think, oh, people will know everything that the Bible says is true about me, that I'm a sinner. And you're like, yeah, that is the, the point, right? Please stop looking at the weapons God has given you to kill sin as something that brings shame into your life. Breathe the fresh air of repentance. There's a reason God is putting in his word constantly. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus because he wants you alive, happy that you've been forgiven, that you have an otherworldly joy because you know your failures have been put on him, paid for by him, and his perfect success has been given to you. And your father looks on you and doesn't see disappointment who can't get it together, but sees his son's perfect righteousness and says, behold, my son and my daughter with whom I'm well pleased. Please breathe the fresh air of the gospel and stop falsely viewing repentance and confession as a shameful thing you need to avoid. Glory in saying, oh yes, I'm a sinner. Yeah, yeah, don't look here. Look there. I'm a sinner saved by a gracious, gracious Savior. It is so freeing to know I don't have to pretend like I have it all together anymore. I can just be who I really am 
knowing that I'm clinging to someone who has been perfect on my behalf. You see that difference? What's normal in the Bible Belt versus what is normal throughout the Scriptures, what is said about us as Christians clinging to Jesus. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You don't have to keep up appearances. It's the whole point. I didn't come for the righteous. I came for sinners. So drag your sins into the light. Be known. Confess. Repent. And then there's one more. is an ultimate way to kill sin. You, drag it, you, you see it. You drag it into the light. And then there's one final thing you can do to truly push it out and obliterate it, and that is to replace it. Replace that space in your heart that has been desiring sin. There's a sign in Jeff's office that says this. If you want to build a ship, don't drum up people to collect wood and don't assign them to task and work, but rather teach them to long for the, uh, the endless immensity of the sea. If you want to kill your fleshly longing for sin, you have to replace it with an infinitely greater longing. If you want to kill your sinful fleshly enjoyment of sin, you have to replace it with an infinitely greater enjoyment, namely the God of all enjoyment. Uh, Zane, uh, who is uh, running our sound back there and will lead worship sometime, uh, has... uh, Ruined my life in certain ways. Uh, he's made them better, but he's also taken away things I hold dear. So I used to have a lot of pride in. Uh, I could drink good coffee. You know, I've always had the Zane friends who were like, can you taste the blueberries in this? I'm like, no, I can't. You know, I, I like that, but then I can also drink Folgers with the truckers, right? I'm, I'm just a jack of all trades. I'm all things to all people when it comes to coffee. <laughs> And uh, several people have tried. They've said, stop doing these horrible things and taste this great coffee, and I've spurned their advances. But Zane was very strategic, and he just looked through my kitchen one day, and he's like, hey, why don't we just get you a better machine? This machine's not that great. I'll just get you a better machine. And I thought, I can do a better machine. That makes sense. It's a new new machine. And then a couple weeks later, why don't we get you a grinder? It'd be, I mean, it'd just be fresher. Like, that's not, I mean... Uh, And then next thing you know, I have like a scale. I have a new water filtration system that like filters out so much that we have to put stuff back in it. Like my my home just looks like it's, it's horrible. But here's what's happened. I've lost my ability to drink Folgers. There's Zane. So I, I can't evangelize to truckers anymore because I'm like, ah. Uh, is this Oak Cliff? Is this, you know, was this ground yesterday? Uh, <laughs> tasting the better coffee, tasting the purer water has ruined my taste of the lesser to where I don't want it anymore. If I really, really want coffee and I have the option of Folgers or breathing, I choose breathing now. I don't like it. You see that the greater enjoyment has actually pushed out the lesser. If you want to say goodbye forever to the false fleeting pleasures of sin, taste and see the goodness of your your sweet God. If you want the world to be bitter to you, drink deeply of your infinitely beautiful God. St. Augustine, who is... uh, the most influential person, maybe in the church, post-Bible times, post-Paul, uh, at least in the Western church, uh, wrote a, a, an autobiography about his life called The Confessions. Many of you have probably heard of it. It's one of the most famous books in the church. And he's recounting his life story. It's an autobiography, but it's a prayer. And he's framing, he ironically wrote it to show people how bad he was, and it just made people think he was more holy. Uh, but he, it, the, the framing of his life, the battle of his life, is enjoyment of the world, namely lust, versus enjoyment of God. And so I have some quotes here I want to read you guys just to see this dramatic story, because I think this perfectly illustrates what we're talking about here. Here's Augustine showing how he's deeply indulging in the pleasures of the world, especially lust. He says this, I was still, this is a prayer, I was still held firm in the bonds of a woman's love. 
I did not persist in my enjoyment of God. Your beauty drew me to you. But soon I was dragged away from you by my own weight. And in dismay, I plunged again into the things of the world as though I had sensed the fragrance of the fair but was not able to eat of it. I began to search for the means of gaining the strength to enjoy you. But I couldn't find uh, I couldn't find this means until I had braced the mediator between God and man, Jesus Christ. So you see this battle here. Enjoyment of the world versus enjoyment of God. And here's his conversion account. O oh Lord, my helper and my redeemer, I shall now tell and confess to the glory of your name how you released me from the fetters of lust which held me so tightly shackled and from the slavery to the things of this world. I was held back by mere trifles. They plucked at my garment, at the garment of my flesh, and whispered, are you going to dismiss us? From this moment, we shall never be with you again forever and ever. There's the whispers. We're not that bad. Are you really going to say no to us forever? I flung myself down beneath a fig tree and gave way to the tears which now streamed from my eyes. In my misery, I kept crying, how long will I go on saying, tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow I'll repent, tomorrow I'll confess to somebody, tomorrow I'll truly give my life over to the Lord. Why not now? Why not make an end to my ugly sin at this moment? And then he hears some kids playing far off, and one kid keeps repeat, repeating this phrase, take it and read, take it and read. And he comes to this conclusion that, it's a sign from God to grab the Bible, open it up, and read the first verse that his eyes fall on. So, greatest theologian in the church, that was what he concluded in this. And he says this. So I hurried back, seized the book, seized the Bible, and opened it. And in silence, I read the first passage on which my eyes fell, Romans 13, 13. Not in reveling, in drunkenness. Not in lust or wantonness, not in quarrels or rivalries. Rather, arm yourself with the Lord Jesus Christ. Spend no more thought on nature and nature's appetites. I had no wish to read more and no need to do so, for in an instant, look at this description, in an instant as I came to the end of the sentence, it was as though the light of confidence flooded into my heart and all the darkness of doubt was dispelled. You see that? What pushes out the darkness, the light flooding in, pushes it out. Enjoyment of God taking victory over enjoyment of the sins of the world. And then he later in his life summarized this whole thing, what was happening in his conversion. And this is the most important paragraph. How sweet all at once it was for me to be rid, look at this, of those fruitless joys which I once feared to lose, the sins of the world. You, O oh God, you drove them from me. You who are the true, the sovereign joy, you drove them from me and took their place. You who are sweeter than all pleasure. O oh Lord, my God, my light, my wealth, and my salvation, how do you gouge out your eye and cut off your hand? An infinitely greater joy has to drive out all the fruitless joys of the world. Do you see the infinite eternal difference between just obeying the rules of an indifferent God and this, living in light of, living in relationship with the living God who loves you and sent his son so that you might find a means of enjoying him forever. One smile from your father drives out the false smiles of the world. One second in the embrace of your merciful Savior makes all the best the world has to offer you, just, just ash, just worthless. 
the comfort of the Spirit, the rest that comes from the indwelling Spirit, pushes out all the false promises of the world. What does, again, David say over and over? Better is one day in your courts than thousands elsewhere. One thing, Psalm 27, 4, one thing I ask of the Lord, to dwell in your house, to gaze upon your beauty all the days of my life. That's number three. Replace them with an infinitely greater joy. You must know this king, this savior, preaching this sermon on the mount. And the more you do, the more you will hate anything that would turn your eyes away from him. Sin, so many of us, we think our passions are too great and they need to be contained, so we just try and white-knuckle it. C.S. Lewis would say it's the exact opposite. Your, your passions aren't too great, your desires aren't too great, they're actually too small. It says this in a, a famous quote, if we consider the unblushing promises of reward and the staggering nature of the rewards promised in the gospel, it would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy has been offered us, like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. Stop eating gum off the street when you've been invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. See sin for what it is. Hate it for what it robs you of. See where it's taking you. Kill it with an infinitely greater delight. The God that is sweeter than all pleasure. I want to end by, uh, I, I'm well aware, I'm a pastor, so I, I should be aware of this, that so many probably feel condemned by, by heavy sermons, and uh, it's, we, we have the reaction that Adam and Eve have. They, they see their sin, and what do they do? They flee, and they hide in shame. They're running from God, and we, again, the devil jumps on this and says, people are going to reject you, and God's going to reject you. You need to hide this. You can't expose this. No one will love you. You're worse than everybody. No one else is wrestling with this, and that's how we view God most of the time. So I want to give us an accurate picture of God one more time. I want to take us from this mountain, Sermon on the Mount, to another mount in Samaria in John 4. And there's a woman in the city who is overwhelmed with shame. And she goes out to draw water. She waits until no one's there. So she's, she's avoiding everybody. And she goes one day, and she meets Jesus. She meets this Man, and in this encounter with him, he draws out the reality he knows her. He knows everything she's ever done. She has had five husbands, and the man she's living with now isn't her husband. And his, her, her, her sins don't make him shriek. Rather, he says, come to me. I will give you a drink, and you will never go thirsty. And what's her reaction in this encounter with this Jesus she flees into the city. She's not hiding from anyone anymore because of her shame. Her shame has now become her boast. She runs throughout the city saying, come, meet a man who's told me everything <laughs> I've ever done. Could this be the Messiah? And she is, becomes Samaria's greatest evangelist. Her greatest shame that she was hiding from everyone instantly turned to joy because she met this Savior do you not want that same joy? Please stop hiding. Please stop treating sin like this easy thing you're in control of because you're afraid of people's thoughts of you. You have a Savior who says, come. Let's pray. Father, Sometimes when I think about the realities of the gospel, I think this is too good to be true. And then I'm instantly reminded of passages like, well, you're the God who does far more than we could ever ask or think. You're the God who does stuff that's too good to be true. You're the God who gives us a love that surpasses all knowledge. You're the God who is an infinite treasure. And though we were sinners, 
not a little bit, but rebels. We, wanted, we, didn't, we weren't just indifferent to you. We wanted to displace you. We wanted to stand in your place. We'd rather you not exist because we would like to be God. You send your son who dies for us while we are still sinners. And I pray that you would not allow the lies of the enemy to keep us from him and the shame of sin, to keep us from the freedom that he bought because we know he's going to go to the cross. He's going to take up all of our sin and go to the cross and pay for it. And not just pay, not just wipe our debt sheet clean, but he's going to give us his perfect life. Where we're now clothed, not with our filthy rags, but with his righteousness. And again, I just, I pray that you open our eyes to it. And that our lives look different because we have been transformed by a living God who is infinitely greater. I pray that we'd be a little less distracted from your beauty and that we would taste and see, that we would gaze upon your beauty, that we would dwell in your house, oh God, all the days of our life, looking forward to the day when we will actually dwell in your house all the days of our life and gaze upon your beauty every day. Change our hearts, keep us from shame, make us hate sin, Lord, that would turn our eyes away and kill our joy. The joy that can only be found in you. You are the fountain of living water. You're the only true well that makes our hearts spring up. And I pray that we would run to you. I pray that in your son's holy name. Amen.